So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, as always, um, with me, Dotton, and the legend Dino, who is in Rio, Tim Vickery, but about to make his way over here. Never mind that, Tim, because I think we are talking about something very special today when we take a look back at uh, great football games in the archives to discuss them. I, I would say it's a, a rivalry beyond comparison we're going to be talking about today. Yes, and, and plenty of things to get into, both from a, a football perspective and a, a historical one as well. So I'm looking forward greatly to being a little bit less stupid at the end of this podcast than I am at the start. <laughs> well, you and me both, <laughs> mate. So thankfully, we've got somebody that can talk to us about this amazing match in um, 18th of November 2009. Um, Egypt versus Algeria, the football writer and economist Hussein Kamal is with us. Um, you're from Egypt, Hussein. So the first question. But I was born much... in the UK. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. You're from Egypt. So the big question is mm. how much of a bias will this conversation have? Can you do it socially objectively? I don't mind the bias. Don't get me wrong. If, uh, it, if it was Nigeria. No, I think... I'll try to be as unbiased as I can. Good. I think I'm, I moved on 14 years onwards. I think I moved on. <laughs> but it still it still hurts 14 years onwards. So my first question is, my first question is, was Egypt robbed? Um, yes and no. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> yes, because this 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 particular team deserved to be in the World Cup, but. Um, if we if we look at Egypt in this particular qualif uh, World Cup qualifiers, Egypt was abysmal. Really, uh, played awful games and doesn't deserve to to qualify for the World Cup. But this generation deserves to qualify for the World Cup. And this this, this is what makes this game so sharp. It's a direct playoff for a place in South Africa. It's on a neutral ground. It's in Sudan. It's Algeria against Egypt. It's winner take take all and nothing to the loser. So the stakes are very, very high, aren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so you cannot really disconnect this game from the, the game four days earlier. So basically, Egypt, uh, there was a game in Cairo, Egypt against Algeria. Egypt needed to, to win um, um, the three-goal difference. And Egypt scored in the second minute of the game. And in the last minute of the game, and that's why they, they were sent to the, to the playoff in Sudan. But we'll get on to this later on. Uh, and the, you, the you can't really separate it from from events not only four days earlier, but maybe uh, 150 years earlier, because <laughs> exactly. it seems yeah. what I want to learn here is <laughs> nationalism. This is a story of of nationalism, and nationalism is really something that breaks out in Europe in the 19th century. You know, in Italy and Germany, for example, become countries in the second half of, of the 19th century. And I would imagine that it hits your part of the world later, maybe during or in the aftermath of the First World War, when the idea of self-determination. Uh, and I wonder the links between the importance of Arab nationalism and football. Because one, I think, one thing that is really striking for me is right from the start of international competitions, Egypt are there. Yeah. I mean, decades and decades, half a century before sub-Saharan Africa makes yeah, an appearance, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt are there. The Does the that problems. mean that nationalism and football are very, very linked in Egypt? And when Algeria achieves independence in that bloody fight against the French is like Egypt. The model is right. They've got football. We want some of that as well. Is is that where the rivalry comes from? Uh, so, yeah, Egypt is one of the, the African Federation founders alongside uh, Ethiopia and Sudan and is the winner of uh, Af the first two versions of AFCON. And yeah, as you rightly said, Egypt uh, football in Egypt has started uh, early on in the early 20th century, obviously because of the British occupation, so that helps. <laughs> um, 
and the first big the, the big clubs of Egypt, Ahli and Zamalek, were all established in in the twenty in the beginning of the twentieth century. Um, back to your question about nationalism, um, I think it has something to do with it because in the fifties. With the rise of Pan Arabism and Nasser, I think the entire Arab world was looking at Egypt as as the model, as the leader of the Arab world. And Nasser had a very, very big contribution to um, to supporting the, the Algerian revolt against the French. Um, so it, it's funny here where, because because in a way, there are there aren't sufficient reasons uh, for the Algerians to hate Egyptians in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> and for Egyptians to dislike Algeria because we were kind of brothers, we were allies against uh, against the colonial powers. Um, however, however, I think we can trace back um, the rivalry to to the to the Algerian um, revolution against the French. So, the Algerian team preceded, actually preceded the 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 the, the independence of Algeria as a country. So, the the National Front. Uh, they established a team, uh, an Algerian team, an Algerian football team, and they were playing along. Uh, they were playing all, um, in, in Africa to promote their independence and their cause. And funny enough, Egypt refused for this team, refused for them to, to to come and play in Egypt. So I think we can trace back the rivalry to this very point, when 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 Egypt refused uh, uh, refused this team, the, the the liberation team, the liberation football team, to play uh, inside Egypt. Even though we were supporting their independence, arguably, arguably though that is just part of the story because there are similar things. I mean, there should be a rivalry, a really bitter rivalry, for example, between uh, Denmark and Sweden now because similar trajectory in terms of um, you know I I international politics that. The Swedes allowed the Swedes, who were neutral and had been neutral in the two world wars, allowed the Germans to march through their country to invade Norway. So the rivalry should really be Sweden and Norway. Big, big, bitter rivalry. I know, for example, my uncle, who was married to a Dane, her father, when he was alive, he said, look, you know, you can marry whoever you like, but not a German, not a German, because they occupied us and this is how they treated us. So she ended up marrying a Nigerian. <laughs> and but the rivalry has dissipated over the years. You know, it's, it's still a rivalry, but it's a rivalry more for bragging rights than national um, redemption or whatever it might be. I, I still think there's more to this story. I wonder whether Libya, which is the country that separates Algeria and Egypt, has a role to play, given its politics, um, certainly since Muammar Gaddafi uh, took power. Does it have a role or not? Am I reading too much uh, into this? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But the, the one thing I, uh, I want to highlight regarding Libya, so... Uh, so basically, I think that the, the real start of this rivalry, as we know it today, so Egypt played against Libya in, in what's so-called the, the African Games, which is the African version of the Olympic Games in 1978. So there was a football game between Egypt and Libya, and the games were held in Algeria. Okay, This is in 1978. So right after the Camp David Accords between uh, the, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. So the sentiment in the, the Arab world was really, really bitter towards Egypt because we were perceived as the traitors, as the ones who betrayed the, the, the Palestine and the Arab cause and pan-Arabism. So the shift happened from Nasser with Arabism and Egypt is the, being the leader and anti-Zionist, anti-Israel to Sadat, pro-American, pro-Israel, uh, yeah, pro-American more than pro-Israel, but but yeah, at the end of the day, we signed a peace treaty with Israel. So, um, so in that game, um, clash erupted between the two teams, and uh, the, the Algerian police and the Algerian fans attacked the Egyptian team, and so that back then ordered the, the, the entire Egyptian delegation to go back home. So that was, in my opinion, the real beginning of of of, of, of the rivalry and the hatred in a sporting sense, even though in a political sense. We were traditionally allies. Both countries were traditionally traditionally allies. 
And in a in a totally just strictly footballing sense, there's an extra reason for the rivalry, which is you could argue that Africa is underrepresented. Uh, so there are fewer slots for Africa, hence the fact yep. that it comes down to just one for both Egypt and Algeria. If this was Europe, for example, and there were more slots available and both could qualify, yep. you wouldn't get the footballing rivalry. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It it it, uh, it plays a big role. I I, I think so. Uh, but now we cannot really claim because I think Africa has sufficient. Yeah, it's still underrepresented, but but better than before. I mean, back then, Egypt. I mean, Egypt qualified to the 1934 World Cup in Italy, and uh, uh, the playoff was against Palestine under the British mandate, <laughs> and then. Um, and then Egypt had to 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 play against European teams in the 50s to qualify to the World Cup. It shows you the the I mean, adding to your point, shows you the, the the misrepresentation of African teams. It is a really important point though that Tim brings up, because I think it's very clear when you watch this match. And by the way, there is a pitch invasion at the end, but it's not surprising. It's not surprising given the amount of um passion that uh, both sets of spectators are going into this match uh, uh, and I don't think people realize in Europe where we are rather spoilt as Tim's question alluded to with getting into World Cups over and over and over again you know if we don't get into World Cup well lucky the Scots they got into the World Cup so we've got sort of somebody to support and if not them well I don't know who we'd support otherwise. Anybody but France, you know. Uh, I think they're so. Spoiled. Would the would the Egyptians have been supporting Algeria Ooh. in the World Cup? Oh no, <laughs> never. Don't think you get this, mate. <laughs> no, never, so, never. So there, there, were, never? there was a there was a day uh, in uh, in in June July of two thousand and four when you were one hundred percent Slovenian. <laughs> I, was, I was Slovenian, I was English, I was American in 2010, I was Belgian, I was German, even though I'm not a big fan of German football, I was I was a German. Uh, but they, the, the funny thing about Algeria that usually they do really well in World Cups, in 82 they did really well, uh, in 2014 they did really well, but that I think that increases the rivalry, that doesn't decrease it. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, anyway, Tim knows all about that because he was Barcelonan at a particular uh, Champions League final. Um, do you remember that, Tim? When, when you were Barcelonian? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. I've yeah. got for a moment. Yeah, I've, I've just... shaken the hand of Belletti and and and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and sung at him. Chim, chimney, chim, chimney, chim, chim, chiru. <laughs> Naim from 50 and Belletti from two. Yes. I, I was in Jamaica at that time and I was thinking of you and I knew you were supporting Barcelona. <laughs> anyway. I am poor, the, the day that we're recording this is a week before I become Porto for a day. <laughs> so it happens that that's a good backdrop so the match congratulations to them if 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 they win okay so you're hedging your bets already but the the um the match that we're talking about 18th of november 2009 like you say egypt versus algeria it's taking place in sudan yeah, what and the you... supporters where have they come from because it, it's okay. it's it's very quick, is, isn't it? You know, it's it as you yeah, said, it's just a, a few days after. Point. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is a very important point. The fans. So basically, we found out that Egypt will play against Algeria four days later. So Egypt, it was Egypt's choice actually to to go to Sudan. So they tossed it, and Egypt chose Sudan because in the Egyptian uh, grandiose pharaonic. Uh, leadership uh, kind of uh, mentality. We thought Sudan are our little brother, so obviously if we play in, in, in Sudan, the fans would be supporting Egypt. But actually, most most of the Sudanese were, were supporting Algeria, because <laughs> again, we are a sporting rival rival to Sudan, but we don't see it that way. We see, them, we see ourselves as the older brother. But anyway, um, the fans, so and this is a very important point I'd like to, to, to touch on. So this was the time of um, Gamal Mubarak, who is Mubarak's son. This was the time when uh, they were kind of um, 
propping him up to become the next president. So there was the inheritance project, as they call it in Egypt. Um, so between 2001 to 2009, these were the years where Gamal Mubarak was the rising star. And this created a lot of anger and opposition uh, within, within the Egyptian uh, opposition. Um, so basically, when we found out that, that Sudan, uh, that we would play against Algeria and Sudan four days later, Egypt wanted to use this opportunity to, to, to use the game for political gains. So we sent. We didn't send the, the real fans, the the, the 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 real hardcore football fans. We sent the celebrities. We sent um, cinema stars. We sent singers. We sent ex footballers, and then who? Uh, and, and obviously we sent Gamal and Ale, who are Mubarak's sons. Whereas Algeria, because they were taking revenge from what's ha what happened four days earlier, they sent their craziest fans. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real ultras, <laughs> the real Algerian ultras, and, and Algerians. To be fair to them, are, are 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 fanatics. They are they create an amazing atmosphere. So the minute you you you, the first minute of the game, I knew Egypt would lose. Looking at the stadium, I, I knew it. I knew Egypt would lose. The Egyptian side was calm, was cheek, was uh, <laughs> and the, and the Algerian side was full of passion, full of fire, full of you name it. But it you was, know, as, as you've said, it was a, a, a terrific generation of Egyptian players. And I know a lot of these names looking down the team sheet from the Club World Cup, where it was Al Ali oh, were, yeah. were, were, were playing there with, with the frequency. And you can see it was, it, it, it's a really good side. So is it for this generation, is this a constant sort of regret, regret and lamentations that, it's, yeah. that they, didn't, they didn't make the World Cup? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a big uh, big regret. So Egypt won the African Cup of Nations in 2006, 2008, and 2010. And remember that Africa back then, uh, the Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, um, this is the drug golden generation. So Egypt beat them in the final in 2006. We beat them 4-1 in 2008. This is uh, Sam Samuel Eto's Cameroon. We beat them 4-2 in 2008, beat them again in the final. So Egypt was really taking... the the continent by storm so it was it was part of the egyptian arrogance going into this qualifiers that we would cruise into the world cup we didn't even consider algeria as a as a as a threat algeria has haven't qualified to to the african cup of nations since 2004 um so yeah and, and actually the first game of the qualifiers they drew against rwanda and they they dropped two points already so i mean at the start of the qualifiers we Egyptians had no doubt this team would be in South Africa and perhaps maybe reaching the quarters, the quarterfinals wow. of, of uh, yeah, yeah. Now I fear we stop being friends because <laughs> th th this is something which has continually uh, irritated me about sides mm. from this part of the world, including Egypt. They can play. North Africa? Yeah, North Africa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can play. They can really, really play. But I always find them too cautious. Too I cautious, if, yeah. Yes. I don't know if this is a mentality thing. I don't know what it is. That's an interesting point. I think you're absolutely right, except this generation. I think this generation didn't, didn't get the chance to show um, the opposite of what you're saying. So you're absolutely right. I think it's, um, I think it's an inferiority complex with regards to Egypt, because we do not see ourselves as North African, we see ourselves as Egyptians. Actually, we consider North Africans as our footballing enemy. So Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco are Egypt's curse, and, and I'll uh, because they 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 uh, they kicked us out of the, the qualifiers in 82, Morocco, 86 was Morocco, uh, 1998 was Tunisia, 78 was Tunisia. So, so I think it's an inferiority complex regarding um, the case of Egypt. So when we played in 1990 uh, World Cup, I think the entire world made fun of Egypt with uh, Egypt's performance against Ireland and and e even England. But people forget that actually Egypt played a really really offensive game against the Netherlands the first game. But uh, yeah, I think it's more of the mentality of minimizing losses rather than than being expansive and 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 pay the price for it. I don't think we. We're willing to pay the price, and 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 uh, yeah. 
the pay, pay the price of expansive football and losing heavy scores. Yeah. But on Although, a better pitch, on a better yeah, I was pitch. Say, you know what? Go on, go on. No, Take no, the no, ball no. and run with it. Even no, no, no. Pitch. Just um, yeah. It, Egypt weren't naive in terms of football, were they? Um, and as Tim says, me. it was like t- an entire team hanging off their own crossbar. I remember the, the Ireland game in nineteen. Yeah, it was one of the worst that. games of football but, that I've ever seen. But if you think about it, um, they. Here, arguably, if it had been a better pitch, as Tim was alluding to there, if it had been a better pitch, they would have shown the kind of football that won Spain, you know, a World Cup. Uh, I mean, this 2006, 2008, 2010 generation, um, uh, if if you look at the Confederations Cup, uh, watch Confederations Cup uh, in 2009, if you watch Egypt against Brazil, and and Tim, I'm sure you watched that game. I did, yeah. Yeah, that was an, an amazing performance by each. It was offensive, mm. didn't didn't lack any any confidence. Uh, we attacked Brazil as as if they were Egypt and we were Brazil. So, in that sense, I I think if Egypt had the chance to to qualify for the 2010 World Cup, I, I don't think we would have been as as cautious as uh, as the 1990 generation. And Algeria, yeah. for example, who who won the spot went to the World Cup and didn't score a single goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, with Egypt, I think there is a, a structural issue that most of our players play inside Egypt. So they get really intimidated when they play against uh, foreign teams. Um, yeah, this is where the inferiority complex... Uh, I think with this, with Salah, uh, it has changed a little bit. So he's given us confidence that maybe we're... We're not less human. We can play football. <laughs> yeah, now I, I need your your translating skills um, because uh, we've seen the, the highlights and the the match commentator uh, quite often seems a little bit bemused by just the speed of, of, at which things are happening. There's a lot of just going oh oh because he can't quite his mouth can't quite keep keep up with his emotions. But when he can get the words out, it's yasalam yasalam yasalam. What does Yasalam mean? Uh, it's like, oh my God, uh, something oh. like that. It's, right, it's, so it's a kind of variation. It a, it's oh! Like <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, wow. It's like, wow, Yasalam, wow. Oh my God, wow. There's a lot of passion in the commentary, as it needs to be, because there's a lot of passion, as you've already said, amongst the spectators. There's a lot of passion on the field as well. It's a very tight game, this one, isn't it? It's a very tight game. It's decided by just one goal, and a decent goal at that, I must say. Um, it took a decent goal to to, to beat Egypt, yeah. Do, do you want to talk us through the match then, um, and your memories of it, uh, watching it? I, I, I know because... I was in Egypt about this time, funnily enough, um, certainly oh. to cover the politics. Yeah, you know, this was when the Muslim Brotherhood, it was clear from every single person we spoke to, so this would have been 2009 before this match, it was clear from everybody we spoke to that the Muslim Brotherhood, if there was an election, were going to win. Clear as daylight. I didn't meet a single person you know, a neutral person, if you like, ordinary person who didn't quietly say that they were supporting the Muslim Brotherhood or not. But what I do remember very clearly, and I travelled from Cairo all the way to Suez and stopped off at several places along the way, was uh, the passion of the football. I imagine that everybody in Egypt was watching this game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was... (sighs) It was a dream, it, it, and and the loss was a trauma. <laughs> this is our generation's trauma. <laughs> this game, and and interestingly enough, you you mentioned politics because I think this is what I'd like to 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 focus on, on the, the the interplay between politics and, and and football. So the the regime back then they really really used football for political gains, and 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 uh, the team was doing so well. So. The Mubarak family was keen to show that they were supporting this team and they were the reason behind the, the su- success. And and again, part of the the, the campaign to to uh, to prop up Gamal and to uh, to to prep him to become the the next president. Um, as for the game itself, um, yeah, everyone in, in Egypt. I didn't. I, 
I cannot remember that everyone wanted the Muslim Brotherhood, but what I remember really well is the growing opposition, the growing opposition from 2004, particularly with 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 the the Kifaya movement, the establishment of the Kifaya movement, which means enough in Arabic, and then in 2009, Muhammad Al Baradi, who was um, uh, a growing opposition figure and, and, and a prominent uh, figure in Egypt, he returned to Egypt and. Uh, he declared that he is against Mubarak and he wants to regime change. So there was really a lot of political fluidity uh, within society back then. Uh, but the media attention obviously was directed towards uh, the football and, and the fans also. They, they dreamed of going to the World Cup after 12 years of, of missing out and being traumatized by North African teams every qualifier. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's... That's what I remember from this period. The, 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 where the, were you at this time? Were, were you in England or were you in Egypt? I, I was in Southampton, yeah. I, I was in Southampton. I remember I I woke up at 8 a.m. that day, uh, went to uh, I, I went to London to, to Edgeware Road where all the Arabs <laughs> watched the game. And I remember the police divided Edgeware Road into two sides. <laughs> So the Egyptian side and the other side was the Algerian side. And yeah, we were insulting each other for hours before the game. It's all love, though. It's all love. At least you're insulting each other in the same language for hours. Um, and of course, there is a, a political uh, fallout to come two years on with the uh, Arab Spring Revolution. But... I imagine at the time when that goal is scored, relatively early on in the match, in the first half, yeah. that that Edgware Road just erupted. I mean, I, I I was there. I was again sent to the Edgware Road on the night that Gaddafi was um, assassinated, if you want to call it that, and <laughs> the Libyans were out in force on that night, and it felt like you know. Um, all through the night, actually, cars going up and down. So the Edgeway Road, as you talk about, certainly the Marble Arch end of it, is becomes yeah. little North Africa at the best of times. So I imagine, do you remember what it was like when that goal went in? I remember four days earlier when Egypt scored in the final minute to, uh, I mean, to reach the, the the playoff. It erupted, but it was it was positive eruption, so it was our side. Of course, <laughs> and uh, and then. Four days later, it was complete silence. And the On one side, side and it's road. Mad madness. Yeah, it was madness. The Algerian side was absolute madness. Yeah, uh, I remember very well. But yeah, well, what, what, what does that do to? <laughs> what does that do to a football fan? Then I mean, I'm, I'm presuming at that point you still think you've got a chance and you're going to have that no, chance. No, no, I didn't, no, I didn't think so. No, I didn't think so. Actually, watching the fans and how the stadium looked like, I, I think I was very pessimistic. And the way Egypt pl played was very... Um, it was... It lacked the, the fluidity of the, of, uh, of the game. And I think what, what played into it is, is, the, is the state of the pitch. And I think psychologically, when, when the players went in and saw the, the Algerian side and the Algerian fans, and they saw our side and how off the Egyptian side was, I think it terrified them. And uh, and I, I really think the pitch uh, helped the, the the physical, aggressive game of the of, of the Algerian team. It didn't really play into the e e Egypt's game at all. Who were the superstars on, on, on both sides? Uh, so... Uh, Egypt's side was uh, Mohamed Abu Trika, a legend and an Ali player. Uh, uh, the goalkeeper, Asam Al Hadari, uh, he's a legend of the game. Uh, Mohamed Zidane, he used to play for, for Dortmund. Uh, uh, Ahmed Hassan, uh, he's the captain of the team. He uh, played for Anderlacht and Besiktas. Um, as for the, the Algerian teams, there was actually the left back of Portsmouth, uh, Nadir Bilhaj. Uh, he was a good player, and there was Karim Zayani. He used to play for Wolfsburg. Um, there was Majid Bouguera. I played for Rangers. 
so those were the key were the key names on both sides, uh, and there was yeah Rafiq Hellish also he was a, a really good defender, and Antar Yahya the, the goal scorer, the, the the goal that sparked a revolution <laughs> in Egypt two, well, two years. <laughs> yeah, the, the this game that we're talking about, it's known as the game that almost started a war. Why? So basically, uh, so let me take you first back to. Uh, the 80s. So in 1984, there was a playoff between Egypt and, and Algeria uh, for the Los Angeles uh, Olympic Games. And, and uh, at the end of the game, uh, a big fight erupted between the two teams. It, it was so ugly. It was so ugly. And then six years later, there was another playoff between Egypt and Algeria in Cairo. And I think this is what got me interested in, in, in the history of, of Algeria against Egypt because my dad was in this game and it was the, the World Cup qualifier for 1990. And after the game, Lahdar Balloumi, he's an Algerian football legend, uh, he actually threw a, a bottle um, on, a, on an Egyptian doctor in a hotel and he, um, the guy went blind, the doctor went blind and, uh, and he was, yeah, yeah. And... Um, and um, he was uh, he was actually uh, uh, what is it called in English? Um, tried in absentia. Is is this the right yeah, word? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and he wasn't allowed to leave Algeria because he was chased by the Interpol. And uh, yeah, uh, so it's a big story. And then again in two thousand and one, uh, Egypt needed two goals against Algeria in the final game for the two thousand and two World Cup qualifiers. And uh, and Algeria was out of the qualifiers already, and the Algerian t uh, fans they attacked the, the Egyptian the Egyptian team, and the game stopped for forty five minutes, and then they attacked the coach afterwards. So there's a lot of um, um, ugly history between the two teams. So going into this game, you could expect that something would happen after the game. So four days earlier, the game in Cairo, the Egyptians attacked. The, the the Algerian coach before the game and uh, they injured a few players but then the Egyptian media claimed <laughs> that this was orchestrated by the Algerians and they hit themselves and the driver of their bus came on TV he's Egyptian obviously and he said <laughs> they were beating themselves up with stones <laughs> so there was so much anger between both teams and the media and the Egyptian media played into it and they they really said awful things about Algerians and Algerian independence and that they're not Arab, that they are French and we are we help them with their independence. And the Algerians they the Algerian media was insulting also the Egyptians and they used to call us uh, <laughs> the sons of belly dancers <laughs> because Egypt is famous for belly dancing. So it was those kind of ugly things. So after the game uh, I remember very well um, a few, half an hour, an hour after the game, I opened the Egyptian channels to just watch what's happening, and then suddenly I I found out I find out that there's hysteria across the media that the Algerians supposedly are are chasing Egyptian fans and, and actually killing them. Okay, <laughs> so so so. Obviously, I, I I I fell in the trap, and I I, I believed them back at the, back <laughs> back then, and um, and then Egyptian singers who, who the celebrities and singers and actors who were who were attending the game were were calling talk shows and saying that they they are being attacked and be and and that the members of the National Democratic Party, the Mubarak's party, the ruling party, are being killed on the street <laughs> and things like that. So it made me furious. I, I remember I didn't I didn't go to uni for three days and I emailed the FIFA back then asking for the game to be replayed. And um, did you get a reply? Uh, sorry? Did you get a reply from FIFA? <laughs> no. <laughs> no reply. And Mubarak's son, Ala Mubarak, I remember uh, he, he was on a talk show and said uh, some along the lines that uh, Enough with with Egypt with Egyptian leniency towards Arabs. We are the the big sister or the big brother, and uh, they are taking advantage of us. So now we need to 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 draw a line and no more being you know kind to them. 
and uh, and yeah, those sort of things were were aggravated the the the, the national feeling and 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 the feeling this, of, this, of this is this is the depressing idiocy of nationalism, isn't it? At, it, at its most irrational and it's 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 most stupid and it's most counterproductive. And what Absolutely. were those stories of of Egyptian celebrities being attacked and Egyptian fans killed? Was there any truth in these? I mean, my friends who went there said they they just threw some bottles on them. Really, that's that's it. It's minor. Yeah, no, nothing really happened. It was just usual throwing bottles and things like that. It, it was nothing that the media claimed back then. I mean, I I really thought people are being killed back then. And then the Algerians, uh, they they attacked uh, the telecom uh, company, the famous one, Oroscom, in, in Algeria, and they attacked the Egypt uh, headquarters in Algeria. So really, things escalated badly uh, the, the days after the game. But, you know, that's how wars are started. You know, it, it's um, some minor thing. What is it at the beginning of uh, that Stanley Kubrick film, um, you know, where the the ape throws a bone up into the air and, well, everything else revolves around that moment, you know, the, a somewhat innocuous incident can trigger, well, civilizations to fall necessarily. I do think, though, that Egypt has got a special place. You know, nationalism aside, I do think that, and we, we laugh at some of the anecdotes you're sharing, you know, like uh, we taught those Algerians, you know, we gave them their independence. So uh, they, we are a nation of belly dancers, whatever. But that aside, I do think that Egypt has a special is there anything Place. wrong with being the son of a belly dancer? I, I, I quite like to be a son of a belly dancer. I knew a belly dancer I once, funny enough. So did I. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In Arabic culture, it's so demeaning. Of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a cultural, iconic cultural expression that not everybody will appreciate. But I do think Egypt does hold a special place. You mentioned Sudan earlier. Who's a big brother and who's the little brother? Of course, the Sudanese will say to the Arabs, uh, sorry, to the Egyptians, hang on a second, we're Nubia. <laughs> we are Nubia. So arguably it's the other way around, you know. We taught you guys. And whatever the history is, something extraordinary um was happening in Egypt 3,000 years ago that still kind of resonates today. And you see it in the Great Pyramids. Um, I thought you were going to say that, and you see it in the British Museum. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you feel free to comment on that as you would like, Hussein. But um, when you go in Egypt, it's such a a fascinating place when you do see the pyramids in particular you your jaw drops your jaw drops because you know it's, it's you know, people think seeing stonehenge is a spiritual and, and a magical thing it's not on the scale of the pyramids whatsoever and i can see how a nation can feel a sense of not superiority, but pride, which can very easily, um, you know, run into superiority. But on the football pitch, everybody is even at the start of the match. And Egypt, I'm presuming, has come a long way from this uh, match in 2009. Where is yeah, Egypt today? So, so 15, 15 years on. Yeah, where is it Number today one, in its rivalry? The rivalry has this dissipated Egypt Algeria. And number two, now that we've got a 48 team World Cup and there's the possibility of both these these teams qualifying, how do you imagine that they'll what 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 do you think that they'll be capable of in the next few competitions? So I think the relationship uh, uh, of, of, of I mean between the fans and football really changed after this game because as you as you mentioned two years after there was the revolution so i think the 
the place of football as a as a as a, as a one of the the core foundations of Egyptian pride in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the noughties, I think dissipated. So consequently, the rivalry with other countries uh, in footballing terms dissipated as well. I mean, I, I don't think I'll be as agitated if we're playing against Algeria now. I think it, I think we moved on as a as, as a society from from 2009. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, having 10 teams in the World Cup, I think, will, will lessen the heat a little bit. Um, and yeah, but I think Egypt now has has regressed in terms of football. Uh, I mean, we after 2011, there was the Port Said massacre in 2012. So since then, uh, Egyptian fans are not allowed to to go to stadiums since then until this very moment. So um, uh, there there is huge there's a huge privatization wave in in, in, in football in Egypt. So the the your traditional um, Teams like your, um, uh, well, how do you call it? Um, uh, so you have the, the the you have the traditional teams that belong to to cities, the, to real cities with real fans. Uh, they most of them are uh, relegated, and now most of the teams belong to either the army or the police or petroleum companies, uh, which is a bit weird, I know, for a British person to to, to hear. No. Uh, no. No, not at all, because a lot of the teams started that way, even here in Britain, you know, whether they were teams that were associated with the church or otherwise, you know, a lot. and in Nigeria, where I come from, a lot of teams are still kind of affiliated either to the police force or the armed forces or a supermarket. Do they have, and so on. Do they have re big fan base in, in Nigeria, those kind of teams, or not really? Well, now the Premier League has taken over, so the fan bases are the, the real rivalries and passions are about Premier League teams. Sadly, I hope at some point, you know, with the expansion of the World Cup and with the Africa Cup of Nations, hopefully, being on the cusp of being something special, that that might change. Uh, you, you talked about that massacre, and a lot of football fans will know about it. And I remember hearing about it at the time. We had a correspondent in Egypt, and it told us about the massacre of football. It was just ugly. But do you, do you mind just reminding us of what that was? El Hakli, I think, was one of the teams involved, if, I'm, yeah, if I remember correctly. Please just remind us of what happened there. So basically, 2011 and 2012 were were the years of the revolution, and 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 uh, society was was heated, and there were a lot of there were a lot of demonstrations and so on, and the army was the ruler, the de facto ruler of the country back then, and uh, so basically, the, every month we used to witness a massacre. So when Christians demonstrated for for their rights in Egypt, they were massacred. Uh, uh, the liberals were massacred. So I, uh, four days earlier, before this game, Egyptian, uh, sorry, Ahli fans, they uh, they chanted in the stadium against the army, and they uh, they wanted the release of um, some of their uh, some of the fans who were arrested earlier. And uh, yeah, the game uh, Ahli lost three one. And uh, what happened is that the, uh, Al Masri, the, the opposing team, uh, the, their fans attacked the fans uh, who were the visiting fans, and the fans couldn't really escape because the the, the, the doors were were locked. So um, I, I believe uh, this was orchestrated by by the army uh, to take revenge on Al Ahli fans. Um, there is a lot of a rivalry between Al Ahli and Al Masri, but but it never reached that to that extent. So I really think the army had a vested interest to to take revenge on Al Ahli fans. And uh, a friend of mine died actually uh, in that game, sadly. Um, yeah, so that's what what happened back then. And since then, they they stopped, uh, they banned fans from uh, from attending games. And now we are twelve years onwards, and it's still the case. So, How many people um, so, died? Uh, uh, Seventy-four. Things it's belief, doesn't it? It's um, absolutely shocking. And do do you see a return any time in the near future to 
football being played in front of fans in Egypt? Um, I, I, I think maybe, but on the different terms. So historically, I think uh, football was kind of the, the the gift of the the regime in Egypt for poor people and middle class people. Uh, I think this um, ruling coalition. I think if they would allow fans to come back, I think they will allow fans from a certain social economic standard, and I think. Because, because I mean, again, uh, in, in 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 international games, we have to. Uh, it's FIFA. It's FIFA rule that fans have to attend. So they have this um, company by the intelligence services that issues tickets for fans, and they screen you before you you enter the the, the, the stadium. So, so yeah, it's going to be really closely monitored if fans would be allowed to uh, to attend football games again, and they will not allow. Any descent or or people from, uh, in inverted commas, lower socio backgrounds again. I believe as long as this regime is in place. So we've been talking about the match between Egypt and Algeria on the 18th of November 2009 in Sudan for a place in the World Cup. It's known as the game that almost started a war for you know many of the reasons that Hussein has expressed. Um, well, it's. I think it's a bittersweet sort of uh, culmination of this Brazilian shirt name podcast because of the tragedy that we've just mentioned. But having said that, you know, on the Brazilian shirt name podcast, we we look at the match, we look at the sort of social circumstances. On this one, thank you, so we've been able to look at the history as well, um, going back three thousand years. Now that's a first for the Brazilian shirt name podcast. <laughs> But we also look at the musical soundtrack, if it makes sense to do that today. Well, let's talk about it briefly. I've always wanted to know, I've always wanted to know, and don't take this the wrong way. You're the one who brought up belly dancing, Hussein. I've always wanted to know what it is to walk like an Egyptian. Uh, like, a, like a camel, like this? <laughs> That is so patronizing, isn't it? But there was once a song. Glad called... he said it. Glad he said it. Well, not, not, not one of us. It. I couldn't yeah. say it. But yeah, there was a song. I think Jonathan it Rich. Was, it was a famous song, right? No, that was, that was Egyptian reggae. It was the Bangles who did Walk Like an Egyptian. Oh, right. It was the Bangles. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. Um, have you had a look at the chart of that week of the 18th of November 2009? Uh, not really, actually. <laughs> not Really, well, but maybe I should have a look. It, we don't need to talk about it. Let me just tell you that I got a feeling that it's all about the Black Eyed Peas. And, um, well, there's some bad romance in there from Lady Gaga as well. And um, very little else. Oh, well, Chasing I think, Cars. I, I think that there is an over overreaching. Sex... There's an overreaching point to be made, which is that for so often, for so long, Music was a kind of weather vane. You knew what was coming because of music. I mean, for our generation, Dotton, punk was a kind of boot camp for the years of Thatcher that were just about to come. You sensed it. You sensed it in the air. And the huge event a year before uh, the, the game that we're talking about in, the, in this particular chart is the financial crisis. It's yeah. capitalism basically in real danger of going under, you know, I mean, they decided in the States just to print money because they're thinking, wow, how many guns are there in this society? You know, if the cash machines run out of money, so they just started printing money to try and, and there was a real fear um, that the whole thing was going to, was going to crumble to the ground. Uh, and right, they found a way to, 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 to prop it up, but really we're still living in the, 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 the kind of zombie aftermath of the financial crisis of, of 2008 and you look at the chart certainly it's kind of top 20 and it it's not dealing with that at all very very hedonistic it's almost an attempt not to deal with that there's there's one that stands out for me i quite like it as a song actually which is is miley cyrus party in the usa it's quite a sweet song you know the idea of of the idea behind the song is of going somewhere new and you you're, you're 
feeling a bit unsure of yourself. And then you hear one of your favorite songs and everything's all right with the world. It's quite a sweet song. But the idea, you know, the, 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 the kind of the title, Party in the USA, you know, the, the, the whole pillars of society have very, very nearly fallen, fallen on top of you. And you're going to be living austerity meaninglessly for a long, long time afterwards. But you don't get that vibe from the music at all. So I would I would pose that even by even as early as 2009, popular music is no longer the force that it was from those years through all through the, the jazz years to, to when to when we when we were we were growing up when music was where it was happening, uh, and uh, you know it's, it's the, the the brightest the most creative, the most outspoken people that's where they would go into music until now because it, it's it's just not there is it. It, it, it's it's the triumph of the producer and kind of techno noises and so on. And you don't get the power of communication that you've had for, for, for a century beforehand. Are you saying you were about to say? It's the, it's the year Michael Jackson died, 2009, right? Yeah, yeah good point. Um, a few months before this, actually. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. 2009. I would say, though, Empire State of Mind by... Jay Z, it was him, his song initially, mm -hmm. and and this is his version rather than Alicia Keys, perhaps more famous version, although it features Alicia Keys. But Empire State of Mind at number twelve does what you kind of a little bit for. of that, yeah, yeah. yeah this... It's more about nine eleven attacks. That's really what it is, you know. Um, New York having recovered from that, um, the power I think of the people of New York to recover from what was a trauma. Um, not on the level, obviously, of the kind of national trauma that you talked about in terms of uh, a, a match, you're saying, but, you know, trauma is felt in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. And people have a way of expressing that trauma. Just on a final note on this match, the, the trauma seems to have gone. Where is Egypt now is it able to be itself without uh you know feeling traumatic about events that it couldn't possibly have any influence over is there a lingering sense amongst other or lingering suspicion amongst other north african or arab countries about egypt because it still is the although things may change who knows it still is the only um, Arab country, I think, that signed this treaty with Israel, etc. And we are in the midst of Jordan, a... Jordan as well and the UAE. Oh, I apologise. Okay. Um, but is there still a sense of suspicion about Egypt from other countries? Uh, I think it's not suspicion anymore. Because it's more of the diminished size uh, and role of Egypt uh, since yeah since the 80s really so it's i don't think there's suspicion i think there's more uh hope that egypt could uh regain its 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 role as a as a leader in the arab world because uh, i think what happened in the game uh and how egyptians felt uh, humiliated i think it had something to do with the diminished size of, of egypt and, how, and and the pride that comes in so Egyptians view themselves as this old uh, civilization and so on, and being humiliated by fans, uh, foreign fans symbolically in a uh, in Sudan. I think it it reflected the uh, how Egyptians perceive themselves as, as as a diminished country in 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 in, in its region. And in terms of trauma, uh, I think w what society have witnessed over the last 13 years, I think, put the game in perspective. So having three, four big currency devaluations, uh, rampant inflation, uh, being ruled by a military dictatorship, um, worsening conditions, uh, economic conditions, I think made people put the football and this game in particular in perspective and and and. and made people realize that there are more important things in life than obsessing about a game and uh, and being so upset about it. It's, it's, it's for the end of the day. It's, uh, yeah. You recently published a book. Um, I'm going to ask you how you would, because it's only in Arabic, 
I would yeah, describe I'm... it as football tallies, but perhaps the tallies might... in a way which translates into uh, football stories. Really, uh, this, there's the book. Um, so the, the the story behind this book is a bit funny. I I was working in London, and uh, I went on a Christmas break in Cairo, and then went back to London, and then I I got hepatitis A, and so I spent three four months in bed, and I was so so bored in in rainy London, <laughs> and then I decided to to uh, to write. To, to have a football page called Football Stories, and uh, I used to, I started writing long posts about my memories with with the game in the nineties and the early noughties, and uh, and writing in, uh, international stories as well, um, uh, international football stories, and then recently last year I I decided to to collect all of those stories and put them together in a word document, and I found out that they they are six hundred pages. So I, <laughs> yeah. yes, Alan. Yes, Alan. Yes. Inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> so yeah, I started organizing them and editing them, and and then they became they became a book. You know, it's called foot. Well, it, now that you've said football stories, I may as well say it's football tales. T h l e s t h a l e s. Which wh why that spelling? What does that refer to? Uh, uh, tales. Oh, I, I thought it was spelled T H A L E S. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's in Arabic. I have no translation for it. It's Hekayat Kurawaya, so it's probably football stories for okay. football tales. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> you'd you'd have to know some Arabic to read it. Will it ever come in translation? Uh, I would love to, but my my concern is that. A lot of the, the the humor in the book is so Egyptian. I'm 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 not sure if it's going to be appealing to to foreigners. I'm. Uh, God, try I'll give it a try. Us. Yeah, do, do, try one <laughs> of the humorous stories on us now, if you can do it briefly. <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe. This is a test, people. This is a test to see if it works in translation. Well, Let's son of a belly dancer works oh, for me so hard uh, but I mean it's okay there's there's this one story about who made me fall in love it's the first story of the book who made me fall in love with with football and it's actually the maid she 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 used to come to us her name is Hamida and um, she was uh, she supported Zamalek I support Ahli and I was six years old and she used to play football with me and 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 uh, when I was a kid, and she used to go to the stadium with her, with her, with her brothers, and she used to come back uh, and and tell me the stories about the stadium, and she 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 made me so obsessed with the idea of going to the stadium and and what they say over there and what they what they chant over there, and uh, she 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 was a good football player actually, Hamida, and uh, and and she taught me a lot of football tricks. I mean, this is not humorous. It's just a story. I mean, but and the, uh, see, up to, up to this point, this is this is universal. This is universal. Yeah, it's yeah. The story is universal, but there are some jokes inside that, but it's so hard to to, to, to translate. Um, well, you're yeah, laughing. It's, it's, that's the main thing. You're laughing your head off. Uh, that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, my, people who read it laughed actually because I I, I think the Arabic uh, content, the football content, is is limited. This sort of content, uh, linking football to culture, politics, economics, it's it's pretty limited in Egypt. So I don't think anyone spoke before about the role of their maid uh, in making them love football. Uh, so in Egypt, so I think in that sense, it's 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 nice. It's sweet. It's a, it's a book as you've explained it that works perfectly for our podcast because we talk about football, we talk about the culture, talk about the humorous stories, and hopefully we will be able to talk to you about it again, Hussein, because it's been an absolutely fascinating journey into the history, amongst other things, of football in Egypt. So thank you very much for bringing it thank to us. Thank you very much. I just want to tell you and tell Tim that your your podcast is, is coming on your post podcast was kind of dream to me i i listen to all of your all of your podcasts and i yeah, i'm obsessed with it really so thank you so much for having me i'm i really really appreciate it 
You come back any time you like, and let's talk again. That's it for us, Tim. Tim, thanks very much. You'll be over this side next week, won't you? Ya yeah, salam. Ya yeah, salam. Ya yeah, salam. <laughs> oh, yes, I will be. <laughs>